looking at the Corinthians, and what we'll look at this week, is going to be of a similar ilk. It's about growth, and it's about drawing mercy and truth together. And it's funny that when you've got the the epistle to the Corinthians, the first and the second are so different, it's almost as if you have two completely different cities. And that's why I wanted to call it the tale of two cities. Obviously, it's only one city, but in many ways, they're in such different spots that they're completely different ecclesias. And that's like us sometimes, isn't it? So we can often be the same. That what we, what we valued or what struck a chord with us one week is completely different to what we may need another week. And what I've derived, at least, from the study of the Corinthians is this wonderful thing that we have a toolbox that works for us, which is going to be different in the first Corinthians as it is in the second Corinthians. And we can dip into that toolbox, that spiritual toolbox, and take what we need for where we're at. There's some lovely things throughout the scripture which speak to us and draw us in and take us where we need to go. But when they strike a chord with us, they strike a chord with us of where we're at, not where we need to go. So they're sometimes very aspirational, but they may, for example, in some of the Psalms, start in a very low place. And in the first Corinthians, that's pretty much what we have. When our Lord Jesus was in a low spot, of course, his mind was on the things of eternity that were to come, isn't it? In Hebrews, it tells us that when he was on the cross, what was he thinking of? The joy that was to come, isn't it? So if we could turn to uh, John chapter 17. Now, I've got a habit of picking on people to read. So Josh has got a a microphone, and I'm going to pick on someone to read. Now, whoever gets picked on first gets to pick on the next person. (laughs) Only fair, isn't it? So, Brother Brian, you uh, did the reading earlier that I was in for from uh, Samuel. So I'm going to get you to pick on the first person to, to read John chapter 17, verse 3, when we're ready. I'll pick Brother Cliff right here. Okay. So Brother Cliff, in, in a second, is going to read. Now, what I wanted to say before this, to preface this, was that when we're looking at Moses or looking at Paul, looking at Philippians or looking at Corinth, all we're really doing is we're looking at the underlying factors. We're getting to know the Lord Jesus and we're getting to know how he deals with his flock. We're getting to know what God values, what the Father takes from a particular section. And even though on the face of it we're looking at Paul and we're looking at Corinth, what we're really doing is we're going to enjoy looking at how the Father deals with people, how he shepherds, how the Lord Jesus values his sheep, and how he's changeable. He doesn't always treat us the same. And I find that the most fascinating and underlying facet. So if we could look at John 17, verse 3, when the Lord's in his most difficult position in his life, it was the joy that was set before him of eternal life. And when he defines eternal life in John 17, verse 3, it's not a life which is unending. And so, Brother Cliff, if you'd like to read that. Be the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. All right, so what is, what is eternal life? Forever. It's not, though, is it? It's not to, I mean, that's part of it, but it's not just to live forever. Eternal life is age lasting, but it's to know God and His Son, the Lord Jesus. So eternal life is about living forever. But that's not the focus of it. The focus is that we get to know God. And uh, we probably know that there's a couple different words for know. And this is the one which is the most close of those words. This is the word to know by experience. So we get to know the Lord Jesus and God. And that's what eternal life is about. And so as we go through these studies, we're actually hopefully going to know a little bit about the way God acts and the way the Lord Jesus shepherds. And in doing so, we we draw a little bit towards eternal life, and we have a little taster of it. So we want to get into the epistle to the Corinthians. Now, when we do that, we've got a few passages we can look at relating to Corinth. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time in Acts 18, not 
any time in Romans 16, but there's a lot of information there for the Corinthians. And then, of course, we have the small matter of two longish epistles to go through. So it's pretty, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of chapters to go through. We've got about 30 chapters. Um, here's how we hopefully will go through it. In class one today, we'll look at uh, be not afraid, but speak. And what I love about this is the way that Paul is dealt with by the Lord Jesus and how Paul is in a completely different place here in chapter 18 of the book of Acts than he was just a couple chapters and probably just a couple months before in Acts chapter 16. And then the rest of the titles are there. So Corinth and class one to be not afraid but speak. Now when we're talking about Corinth, it's worth kind of looking on a map. I love maps, so we always, we always throw at least two or three up uh, to see where we're looking at. So not too far away from Texas, right? <laughs> And so here we have pretty much the middle of Europe. And this is, in Acts, you have the sort of, the, the, the spread of it from that tiny room with a few apostles locked up seemingly in the top floor. And now we have this explosion of the truth coming throughout the world. And this is where Corinth is, down in the south there of Greek, Greece. And that spit of land there is, does anyone know what it's called? The, 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 looks like an island. It's called Achaia or Achaia. It's called the Peloponnese Peninsula too. Uh, but in the scriptures, it's called Achaia or Achaia. So right at the top of that is where Corinth is located. And that's an important place. Here's what it looks like. Does anyone know Brother Tom Nagel? Yeah, Brother Tom. And she, uh, Julie's not here, I presume. I haven't seen her. Anyway, so Brother Tom Nagel, whenever he sees uh, photos like this, he always says, which just goes to show all ruins look the same. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where Paul would have been. Now, I've been with an American, having been married to one, to uh, ruins, and mostly the response is, huh, small. <laughs> so, so I imagine that's what you'd think if you went there. <laughs> small. And the reason why it was so important is because you see the southern edge of the peninsula there, those little fingers that stick down, is really dangerous for shipping. And yet, if you look on the top to the left, you've got a channel there which is nice and protected. So what they would do is they'd bring ships in to one side of the peninsula, right at the narrowest point, the isthmus, and then they would actually push the ship or pull the ship across by land to the other side. Now, if you see, this is how narrow it is. It's kind of, you can, it kind of makes sense. So you can either go around and potentially suffer shipwreck like lots of people have in the past or you can actually just go across the land now today there's a canal that runs through the middle of it and I was thinking of doing a Bible study which is going to be a canoe ride through the middle purely for Bible study reasons of course no that's not true but you can see the uh, you can see the one side so I think that's looking to the west you can see the western so the Aegean side over beyond and this would be the Adriatic side and that's a kind of a ship in there. So it's not a particularly high, you wouldn't have to go too, it's not like you have to go up a mountain and down the other side, but it gives you an idea of what they were hoping to achieve. And this is why it was such an important place, Corinth. And they would have had tons of slaves there to drag these ships, and they actually would have dragged it over this. So this is like an ancient sort of railway without rails or trains. So they would actually just take a slave and multiply it by whatever, and unlaid the ship, drag that across from one side to the other, and then yank the ship across. So, pretty crazy, but that was apparently easier than going round and safer. So we come to, to Corinth, and uh, this is an actual photo of it at the time of Paul, and this is where he would have gone. So the marketplace on the left-hand side, I've got a pointer, it's here, would have been there. And uh, right there, above that point, number six, if, you can, if you've got amazing eyesight, would be the judgment seat where Gallio in chapter 18 is referenced. So, this is the actual outlook that it would have had, we think, at this time. And again, I think that uh, most of us would think small. And there was a population of about 100,000. Now, whenever I hear 
these kind of estimates of population. And I look at these places and I'm like, how? <laughs> you go to Galilee and they say, yeah, there was 100,000 people lived in there. And it's about the same size as this room. <laughs> like, how does this happen? <laughs> so not quite sure how it did happen. Uh, now, Paul is in Corinth, and it's pretty clear, actually, what time he was there. And it's about AD 50. And the reason it's clear is because in the start of Acts 18, it talks to us about that Claudius, the wonderful Emperor Claudius, the Roman Emperor, had expelled the Jews from Rome. Now, who had, who had been booted out of Rome? Who, who was listed? Aquila and Priscilla, I heard somebody say it. And it, Paul teaches for 18 months at Corinth. And down here, Gallio becomes the proconsul in AD 51, and he was only there for a year. And there's actually uh, historical artifacts, and uh, they found letters and stuff like this, which, which can date it. So it's a really narrow point in time uh, which we can date Paul at this place. Okay, so let's have a look at Acts chapter 18 then. And the idea of Paul is interesting. When we come here, he, he's in a very different spot than he had been at before. So I call him Superman Paul when he's at Philippi. So Philippi is probably only a couple of months previously. And you remember that him and Silas were beaten with rods and were in prison and the Philippian jailer comes to them and you, know, you remember all that, the earthquake. So Paul is singing hymns in prison. There's no problem at all. Like you can beat me up, I don't care, whatever you do. And that's the kind of mindset of Superman Paul. And yet we come to Acts 18, and it's not Superman Paul anymore. And this is intriguing, that Paul was a very different spot here than he was previously. Now, one of the things I've wondered is, how was his back doing? Because it's not been very long. Was it still open? Could he sleep? Could he, could he move around? I mean, if somebody lacerates your back, it's not like you can put it up like a foot or something. It's attached to you the whole time. So it may be like physically he was in a, a troubled area. Now, when he comes to chapter 17, he's in Athens, and it seems like the Berean brethren had come down with him when he'd come down to Athens on the boat, presumably. And he'd gone back, they'd gone back, and he told them, if you have a look at chapter 17, he told them to bring Silas and Timothy as quickly as they could. So Paul is now alone. So Brother Cliff, if you could pick on somebody to read verse 15 of chapter 17, that'd be good. So we're going to look at chapter 17, verse 15. And while we're waiting for Cliff to pick on someone, he's too nice, he doesn't know who to pick on. Uh, we can have a look at the map here of Paul's second missionary journey. So that's where we're at. So by now, he's done about 1,400 miles. And the University of Stanford has got a tool that allows you to figure out how much the cost of travel was at the, in the, actually in the third century, but you can equate that to the to first as well. And just in terms of travel costs alone, not in terms of staying or eating or anything like that, it would have cost about $20,000 to have got to where he is, about 1,400 miles from uh, where he started the, the second missionary journey. So it was 1,400 miles, and most of that presumably was by foot or cart, and a few bits of, of uh, by, by sail. Now, when he sailed from 2 Corinthians 13, he had a pretty high percentage chance <laughs> of getting into a shipwreck, didn't he? Because by the time he wrote 2 Corinthians, he said, thrice I've suffered shipwreck. It's like, he'd only been on about six recorded uh, journeys by then, so he had about 50-50 chance of ending up in the drink. So it's interesting. So uh, hopefully he didn't, well maybe he did, but hopefully he didn't uh, go in the water on the way to Athens, but uh, it'd be interesting if he did. So we'll have a look at chapter 17. Cliff, did you pick on someone yet? So we've got somebody for chapter 17, verse 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Okay, so he's on his own. At least we don't have recorded who he's with. We know he's not with Silas and Timothy. And presumably those Berean brethren went back by ship to go get them. And Paul's in Athens. And one of the questions I have is, well, when they come back, he's not in Athens. So 
So he said to come and meet him, but he's not stayed where he, he said he was going to be. It's kind of interesting. So Paul's on his own. So that may be one of the things that's behind the different Paul we see here than the Paul we saw with Silas in Philippi. His back's lacerated. And this is kind of the usual that Paul did on all the missionary journey points up until this point. And chapter 18 seems to be a change in the approach. So this is pretty much how Paul did it. He went to the synagogue if they had one. He taught the Jews. Jews didn't accept his teaching so he taught the gentiles the jews got jealous paul got beaten up and he left and then that's when we know when to leave and then it starts in the next one and that's pretty much how all of them went isn't it and he just stays places for a pretty short period of time because it only seems to be a short while and he gets beaten up and then moves on and that's how he moved on from every single point up until now so we have like a change at this point in the way he approaches things now this, to me, shows me the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ behind the scenes. Like, he knows what his sheep can take. And he knows Superman Paul is not in Athens. Superman Paul from Philippi is not in Corinth. And we're going to deal with him differently. And that's the measure of a great leader and a great shepherd, that he knows his flock and he understands when is a time to push and when is a time to pull. So... We saw that Philippi is uh, to the north here. We saw that Paul was in an amazing spot there and he comes down to Athens and he had, had converts in Athens, but he's on his own in terms of his, his usual lieutenants aren't with him. This is uh, what the area looks like, the Aegean Sea that he would have come down through. So not dissimilar to what we might see uh, in this kind of area in terms of the topography. This is the kind of boats that were around in the first century. I wouldn't want to be on one. Uh, look at that. And those, are guy, those are people on the right, so they're pretty small. Uh, they actually had the biggest ships at this time, the first, second, third centuries. They were the biggest ships that they would be for another 1,000, 200 years. So after the Roman period, they didn't have ships as big as this for a long period of time. We don't, it's not told what kind of ship he was on. This is probably something like the ship he went on in Acts 27. And probably these ones were the ones he went on, if he did go by ship, to Athens in chapter 18 or 17. So these are some of the questions I have when we look at Acts chapter 18, of what's going on. So have a look, if you would, to Acts chapter 18. I'm just going to read here a little bit. Um, from verse 1. So after these things, after the things in Athens, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So not too far away, probably a day's journey to the west, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came to them. And because he was of the same craft, he was a tent maker. He abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So in your mind then, hopefully when you see Paul in Corinth, you're looking at a man who's, who's a working man, and he's not reliant on anything. Now we know from other scripture that the only person or the only group who were consulting with him as to whether he had enough were the Philippians, who had sent down something, somehow they got something to him while he's in Corinth and to, to look after him financially. And in verse 4 it says, He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, if you consult the different things that he preaches about, it's different. So he doesn't go and always teach exactly the same to every person. So this is showing some wisdom, isn't it? It also shows what that group needed. Now, what you don't see in verse 4 is what he didn't preach because he only gave them part of the gospel. In verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue, but didn't say what he reasoned about. But when we come to verse 5, we see that Paul had omitted an enormous part of the gospel. So verse 5 says, when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, so they finally found him, maybe they'd gone to Athens first and couldn't see him and just kept going, but when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and earnestly testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. 
In other words, he hadn't told them that in verse 4. So he'd given a partial gospel in verse 4, and now in verse 5, he gives the fullest extent of it. So we can summarize from verse 5 that if Jesus was the Christ, perhaps what he was doing in verse 4 was laying the groundwork, establishing what the Christ was going to be like, sketching the image of the Christ and all the things that were associated with the Christ, with the anointed one, but not saying, holding back from saying it was Jesus. Why did he hold back? Well, he held back until he had buddies with him. And this is just a real simple point that we do better in preaching when we have people with us, don't we? It's much easier to preach when you've got at least one and here two people with you to help you out. Simple. That's just a real simple point that Paul did better. Even Superman Paul did better when he had somebody with him. And what is another reason? He's scared. Now, I'm going to say that because I'm going to read on. But we need some proof of that, don't we? So let's, let's read on. So Jesus was the Christ. That's the key point he hadn't said. Now, why hadn't he said it? This is, um, this is something I'm thinking. A little. Why, why didn't he say Jesus was Christ? Well, every time he did it, he got beaten up, didn't he? Right? So if I'm here on my own, I don't have any buddies with me. Okay, here we go. I'm going to get another beating. Now, imagine what his back looked like. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13 gives this list, doesn't it? You know, I'm going to double check that. It might be 2 Corinthians 12. I'm very spatial, so it's the one on the right-hand side. It's not. It's 2 Corinthians 11. So well, the piece I'm looking at, or the reference I'm referring to, is 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Uh, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in deaths oft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Oh man, alive, none of this is told us in the Acts, or very little of it. So you can only imagine what Paul would think. Every time I say Jesus, I get beaten up. So he, so he, he doesn't do it, and, and he's fearful. So it says in, in chapter 18 of Acts then, verse 6, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. So he knew that was going to be the case, didn't he? And he waited till he had support before he did it. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Now, what did Jesus say about changing the house that you're staying in? Because he'd been staying with Aquila and Priscilla in verse 2. Jesus didn't say to move around, see if you can find the place that's got the best food, did he? He said, stay, stay in that same place. Don't go entering from house to house. So why did Paul change? Why did he not listen to Jesus? Maybe he didn't have an option. It may be that the Jew Aquila and the Jew S Priscilla had booted him out. I mean, I'm just thinking around the subject matter. Maybe it was untenable for him to stay with them any longer. So potentially, anyway, he's, he's moved out. But in verse 7, it says he moved in with Justus, who lived next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, in verse 8, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So there's a great response from some, but many don't have that same response. Now, where is Paul at? This is, in many ways, the key area of this chapter. Verse 9 then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. That doesn't happen every day, does it? Why does Jesus come and speak to Paul now? Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not your peace. You don't tell somebody that if they're not that. Jesus doesn't waste his breath and say, don't be afraid, if Paul wasn't afraid. So we know Paul was afraid. Jesus doesn't come to him in Acts 16 when he's in Philippi and say, be not afraid, because he's not. So the place he's at is the place where the Lord speaks to him. And he's not in a great place. And this, in many ways, makes Paul more accessible to us because we can associate with that, can't we? We know what it's like to be fearful. We know what it's like to be feeling alone and not wanting to say something and not stick out from the crowd. 
and not incur people's wrath. We know what that's like. And look how wonderful the Father is to record this for us. Their problems and their weaknesses are recorded to allow us access to it and to derive the pleasure of understanding that the Lord is sensitive and a good shepherd. It's a beautiful thing. So the Lord comes to him, verse 9, says, Don't be scared, be not afraid, but speak and hold not your peace. So in, in other words, Paul was fearful and didn't want to say something. And so he hadn't. He hadn't told them that Jesus was Christ until he felt forced to when Timothy and Silas had come along. So it's a lovely thing that Paul is being so tenderly and so gently shepherded by the Lord Jesus. Now, he doesn't just say that, does he? He doesn't just say, get on with it, go on, off you go. He gives them a reason to have strength. And it's the same reason that we can have it. For I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt you. For I have much people in this city. Now, in terms of leadership, this is absolutely fantastic. This is telling Paul, don't be scared. Addressing his very his fervently held fear, it seems. Don't be scared. Do what I've asked you to do. So gives him a task to do, something to focus on. But he doesn't leave him there. He says, because I am with you. So even though Paul felt alone, he's always with the Lord Jesus. I am with you. And he now addresses the reason for his fear. And no man shall set on you to hurt you. That was what he was scared of. Superman Paul from all the other places he'd been is no longer there. Now, now it hurts. Now he's in a different spot. And so Jesus changes what his expectations are of this sheep. And he deals with Paul so wonderfully. And he tells him he's not going to set, they won't set on you to hurt you. And yet that was the normal way that he knew to move on to the next city. And so we have a total change in the way in which he's going to go around preaching. He used to go for a short period of time, get beaten up, and move on. And that's how the gospel spread. Well, now, not, as he, not only is he not going to be beaten up, he's going to be staying at places for quite a long time. So he's here in, in uh, Corinth for one and a half years. He's going to be in Ephesus for over two years. There's a totally different change in the outlook. And you don't, it's not like this is never going to happen. Paul's never going to be beaten up again. But you know what? He doesn't get beaten up for a long time. When's the next time it is recorded of him having a beating? The, one, the only one I can think of is when he gets to Jerusalem right at the end of Acts. It's the next, the next stage. So for a long period of time, the good shepherd is saying, okay, we're going to hold off on let, letting that happen to him anymore because that's the way God works, isn't it? Because he doesn't expect of us more than we're capable of. He opens a door and he lets us out through different options. So he doesn't, doesn't push us more than we're capable of. Now, Paul is incredibly capable, but what he had been capable of has changed. And so the shepherd changes what his expectations are. And I find that so wonderful, so exhilarating to know that we have such a God and such a Lord Jesus that they are willing to change their expectations and gently uh, change what they want from us. So here we have him in uh, verse 10, I am with you. No man shall set on you to hurt you, for I have much people in this city. And here we have another aspect that he doesn't leave Paul focusing on himself, because he was, but he gives him a focus outside of himself. Very simple, but very good leadership. To focus not on the now and the suffering, address that, but then move it and push the vision of this man to something else. So the focus is no longer on self. And that's our problem, isn't it? When our focus is on ourself, we're never going to be happy. The only true happiness, from my observation, is when we're serving other people. And so Paul had some good points to make, that he had been suffering. He did hurt. His back was lacerated. Maybe he stuck to the sheets at night still. Maybe it was infected. And yet, now what we're looking to is, look outside yourself, Paul and look at what you've got to do. And so when we focus like that, that's when really we're gonna be coming out of ourselves, coming out of a depression, and we're gonna be looking to serve others. And that is the way of scripture. That was the way for Elijah in 1 Kings 19. That's the way all the way through to Revelation 2 and 3. It's the hope at the end of all those epistles of something to look to. And it's the same hope that was with our Lord on the cross. It was the joy that was set before him. He wasn't focusing on, oh boy, this hurts. 
he was focusing on, right, I've got one more thing to say because I've got to teach him, and I'm going to look to the kingdom. I've got to make sure my mother's looked after. The Lord's focus was not on himself, and he's such a good example. So here we have that same strength that he had derived because he knew it, and he appeals to Paul at the same time. Now, it says in verse 10, I am with you. Now, that's an exhortation that had been used many times, isn't it? That's the Old Testament exhortation to Joshua. And again, here's a man who was in a place where he was scared. Joshua wouldn't be told not to be afraid if he wasn't anyway. Do we hear the exhortation to Caleb, do not be afraid? Caleb's not afraid. Caleb's like Superman Paul. But Joshua is afraid. Otherwise, he wouldn't be told time and time again, don't be afraid. But he's never left there, is he? He doesn't say, just don't be afraid. That's it. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you. And so the Lord Jesus copies the same exhortation that his father had used to Joshua, that David had used to the people. And he's using that same old exhortation. It's an exhortation that's hundreds and thousands of years old. Do you think it's useless now? Do you think that doesn't work for us? Of course it does. So the same reasons that we might be afraid, that we they may not want to speak, are the same reasons that we can base our confidence on that God is with us. Get some friends together. It's easier. Ty, Ty, uh, Timothy and Titus it made it easier. And look outside of yourself. Think about what the task is at hand. And this is so exciting that that's the way it is with Paul here. So verse 11, he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And so here it is, a total change in the way that Paul preaches. Verse 8, 12 says, When Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, this happens a few times where there's a change of leader and the people, the Jews, think, right, now is our chance. We'll get in there. And so they come to Gallio. This is the same Gallio who became the proconsul, or the deputies called here, of that region in, about, in 51, they say the summer of 51 AD. And they brought him to the judgment seat, which we'd seen was in the center of the city, and said, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. So what you see there is another change that Paul doesn't have to stand up for himself. So again, even after 18 months, the Lord Jesus is there. Paul is used to, usually he puts his hand up, isn't it? He usually says he put his hand forth and he spake and he made his defense. And he's about to speak. It's fantastic. I mean, the, the visuals are fantastic. He's about to speak. He's about to open his mouth in verse 14. And then Gallio defends him, who didn't care, like Pilate probably, didn't care anything for the truth of the matter. He just wanted to not have a fuss. And then what we want to look at is in verse 16, he drave them from the judgment seat. And in verse 17, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. Now, when we go back to verse 8, we've already seen a chief ruler of the synagogue. And his name was who? Crispus, right? Now, I'm told that means curly hair. So, you know, when I looked it up, it didn't say that, but it seemed kind of interesting. But uh, if anyone would like to look up, I presume some of you got strong concordances or something, but if you'd like to look up Sosthenes, that's going to become something we look at later on in the week. And that's going to be a meaning of his name is going to play into this. So at this point in time, we see Sosthenes. He comes up in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, again. Here, he is an adversary of Paul. He tries to get Paul in trouble, and it comes back on his own head. It's lovely, isn't it? Don't you love that in Scripture when that happens? <laughs> I love it when that happens. It makes you think of Haman or somebody like that. It's like, yes. So, so uh, it doesn't say there's, uh, well, we're, t we're told not to take the vengeance ourselves, 
It doesn't say there won't be any vengeance. So it's just God's, and he's got to do it. But, but it feels good, right, <laughs> when you see the guy who's trying to get you in trouble, and he gets in trouble himself. But there's an interesting twist to this tale, isn't there, when we come to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. So here's the chief ruler of the synagogue, and he's beaten up before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of these things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, so we don't know how long, but now it's at least 18 months plus a good while, whatever that is, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And we'll look at that more tomorrow. Another thing to point out here is that Priscilla and Aquila come with him. So if, as I theorize, but there's no proof, if he'd left their house because they didn't accept Jesus was Christ, if that was true, they have now accepted that Jesus is Christ and they're coming with him. So one of the things to notice with Priscilla and Aquila is whether it's Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla. Which one is it? So Priscilla is the sister and Aquila is the brother. And if you notice, it's the different way around from what it would have been said in verse 2. So when you carefully read the scriptures, what you'll find is there's six times where it refers to this, this couple Three times it's Aquila and Priscilla, and three times it's Priscilla and Aquila. And what does that tell you? It's not wasted, of course, but what it makes you wonder is, well, who was the driver behind whatever it was? So in verse 18, I'd suggest that Priscilla was the one who was the driver behind them going with, it's my alarm, that means shut up. Priscilla was the one, perhaps, who was the driver behind them going with Paul on his, his next portion of the journey. So he was on his way to Syria, verse 18, but he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So that's the normal course, isn't it? So what I wanted to do, actually, was just end there and just reread from verses 1 through 11. Hopefully some of these questions may have been answered. And I'm going to ask Brother Larry to, to read that. And just hopefully it will speak for itself. <coughs> Chapter 18, verse 1 to 11. Chapter 18 of Acts. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them.